Hi chemistry students. We're here today to continue our quest for the model of the atom. What does an atom really look like? Well, we have a long way to go. So let's take a little step back. And Ms. Doherty taught you a little bit about Dalton's model. So if you remember, I put Dalton's model up here on the screen. Let me get my pen ready. So if I look at Dalton's model, Dalton's model is a hard solid sphere, right? So if I look at this, there's, whoops, there's our sphere. I'm going to maybe color it in. There we go. So hard solid sphere, color it all over it. What's in that? Well, there's no charges right now. There's no subatomic particles. But, you know, he was pretty accurate on what he had. He was basing his information from the early philosophers and the early alchemists. Um, and he came up with his modern atomic theory. Ms. Doherty talked about that, and there were problems with that. So let's move on and start to talk about the guys and one woman who said, hey, if particles are a hard solid sphere, what might be in them? Well, they weren't actually trying to develop a model of an atom, but that's what came out of this. So let's look at radioactivity. Radioactivity, the phenomenon of rays being produced spontaneously by unstable atomic nuclei. You talked about spontaneous decay in integrated science. If you didn't, you may want to read the last part of this textbook. Um, but I'm going to assume that you had integrated, and you know a little bit about radioactive decay. So the first guy we're going to talk about is William Röntgen, very German. And what he did is he took a cathode ray tube. If you know what old TVs look like, kind of like that, there's a cathode ray. They kind of look like a triangle. And electrons were shot toward the glass tube on the ray, and they followed a current around through the anode and back through the cathode. So again, electrons, there's an abbreviation for electrons, would come through these rays, and there would be a light that was given off at the end of this glass tubing. It kind of fluoresced. And so what Renjin did is he said, hey, that's really bright. What happens if I put it into a box? And so we actually put this cathode ray tube into a box, and he noticed that this side of the box was also green, and it started luminescing. He went, whoa, that's cool. So then, of course, you know, like all scientists, he started just picking up stuff around the lab and experimenting. How about a piece of foil? How about two pieces of paper or three? And the green glow kind of went through all the paper and, you know, a few sheets of foil. So then he took some photographic film and he started to develop it with these rays. These were high energy rays. He didn't know what they were, so he simply called them x-rays. So what did he do next? Hey, I'm going to stick my hand, can I draw a hand, in front of the rays. And what do you think happened? Let's watch the video and find out. Vision is the most frustrating of senses. We hear what there is to hear, taste what there is to taste, smell what there is to smell, and feel what there is to feel. If there is more behind what we sense, we don't seem to care very much. But vision is different. When we look at something, we know for a fact that there is more behind what we see. We see the surface of things, not the essence. That makes us anxious. What if there is something really important back there? like God or the truth. It's not surprising then that people have been trying to see beyond appearances for centuries. Plato tried, Galileo tried, and so did Wilhelm Röntgen, as we can see in this famous picture. It was taken by Röntgen himself, probably in early 1896. The German physicist had just discovered, or should we say engineered the production of, X-rays. His first images were understandably blurry, but he'd made corrections. Here he's showing off his newly perfected technique in an x-ray of his colleague Albert von Kulliker's left hand. The effect is still stunning, and it must have been more so for people who had never seen or even conceived of an x-ray. For here we see what we have always wanted to see, the insides of a living human body. The view is satisfying, but truth be told, it is also a little frightening. When Röntgen took an x-ray of his wife's hand and showed it to her, she was reported to have said, I have seen my death. In a sense she was right, or would have been in another age. For before the era of x-rays, ultrasounds, CAT scans, and MRIs, an open viewable body was something to be feared, for it signaled impending death. If you could see inside, you were about to go away. Moreover, the skeleton itself was an archetype of mortality, so to see your own skeleton was to see your own death. 
Röntgen probably knew people would be frightened by his ghostly images. So he took care to include something that served both a scientific and humanistic purpose. Wedding bands. They demonstrated the sensitivity of x-rays to materials of different densities, but they also personalized his images. Without the rings, the pictures say, this is a dead hand. With the rings, the pictures say, this is your hand, and you are alive. This is wow, so Rentgen looked at his own hand, as well as his wife's and the, his lab partners, because, you know, again, you put everything in front of the screen when you're in the lab experimenting. It was pretty amazing for him um, to see that high energy. And again, where was it coming from? It was coming from the metal within that tube. So then along came somebody else looking at energy. And his name was Becquerel. He was looking at uranium ore, also called pitch blend. You see the rock on the picture right there. And what he did is he took this rock. He thought actually the rock could get charged up by the sun. So he took it outside and he charged it up. And then he was doing experiments with him. Watch this and you'll see what he does, and I'll come back. It was Henri Becquerel who, while exposing x-rays, would discover nuclear radiation. Some substances, when placed in sunlight, are fluorescent. They emit visible light. Perhaps they also emit x-rays, proposed Becquerel. To test his hypothesis, Becquerel used photographic plates covered with opaque paper to prevent them from being exposed to sunlight. On the paper, he placed a fluorescent chemical compound. When the photographic plate was developed, it should show no exposure from sunlight because of the opaque paper. So any exposure of the plate should be proof that x-rays had penetrated the paper. For a whole month, Becquerel was unable to find a fluorescent chemical that would expose the photographic plate. Then he tried potassium urinal sulfate. This time, after following his regular procedure, Becquerel found that the photographic plate was slightly exposed. Was the radiation actually coming from the potassium urinal sulfate, or was it coming from somewhere else? He placed an object between the sample and the photographic plate. When the photographic plate was developed, the shape of the object appeared, which seemed to verify Becquerel's hypothesis that x-rays were being produced directly from his fluorescent sample. But one morning the sky became overcast, shortly after he prepared another potassium urinal sulfate experiment. So, Becquerel put the experiment away. When the skies remained overcast for several days, an impatient Becquerel decided to develop the plates anyway. To his great surprise, the plates were strongly exposed. He soon realized that the sample had given off some type of radiation without being stimulated to do so by the sunlight. These Becquerel rays were similar to X-rays in their ability to penetrate paper, which was opaque to visible light. They seemed, however, to differ from X-rays because X-rays could be turned on and off, but not Becquerel rays. Later, Becquerel found that in the potassium urinal sulfate, it was the metal uranium that seemed to be the source of Becquerel rays. The Becquerel rays were not affected by the addition of heat or by treating the uranium compound with chemicals. Wow, so Becquerel was surprised. And again, what the video said is that the x-rays only appeared when they turned on the cathode ray tube, but for Becquerel, the rock didn't turn on and off. For some reason, the energy was coming out of the rock all the time. Now again, you may have learned from integrated, that's alpha, beta, and gamma particles when elements radioactively decay. So 
when uranium radioactively decays and it releases alpha and beta particles, then what happens to it? It turns into another element. Do you remember the word transmutation? Transmutation is when one element changes into another. So there's a vocabulary word. Again, if you didn't have it integrated, it's important that we know what it means. So the last group worked with Becquerel. This is Marie and her husband, Perry. Perry and Marie Curie, they weren't married until they worked in the lab together with Becquerel, but they worked together for a long time. And they took that uranium ore and they actually tried to concentrate it. Uh, Marie spent hours and days and months grinding, grinding, grinding the rock and trying to purify the rock to get energy out of it. And when she purified the rock over and over, she got very powerful energy out of that rock and realized she actually made two new elements. One is polonium from her native land, Poland, and the other one was named radium. These were both more radioactive than the uranium was. The radium itself actually glowed. It had this iridescent blue glow in it when she concentrated it. She ended up winning a Nobel Prize. She's actually the only woman in science to win two Nobel Prizes. Um, but in her work with uranium and radium and polonium, um, she also found that the energy that came off ionized the air. Do you remember what alpha particles are? Alpha particles have a mass of four because there are two protons and two neutrons. So they're positively charged particles. And remember, beta are negatively charged particles. But when the alpha particles or beta emit into atoms of air, what happens is the electrons get ripped off and they become positively or negatively charged. So the air is called ionized. You can think of it like if you even had a light bulb, it might light up because there's so many charged particles floating around. Pierre Curie noticed that he had a sore on his hand, and the more he held the rocks, the larger the gaping wound became. So at first they thought radium was great for you. It was a cure-all. It actually made you feel a little different. And they used to carry it around in their pockets. They would sell it as charms. They'd put it in their pants pockets. Not a good idea. But they did over a long period of time, and they sold it for lots of money. Um, so it wasn't until many years later we realized the biological hazards of radium. And so, of course, it was a sad end for the Curies and Becquerel and Rentgen, who all certainly died of different types of cancers. Um, the Curies, Marie had leukemia, as well as her daughter had leukemia. Um, Perry Curie did not die of cancer. He's the only one that um, didn't, but it's because one late night in Paris when he was walking out of the lab and it was raining, he didn't look both ways, and a horse and a cart hit him and he died. But the Curies get credit for uh, their work with radiation in terming the coin ionizing radiation. And Becquerel was the first one to actually see the radiation, but they get credit for discovering radioactivity. Okay, then we have J.J. Thompson, but I'm stopping there, and I'm going to let you answer a few questions. All right, see you in class tomorrow.